Greetings everyone. Welcome back to Calc 1. And now we need to start putting all of this uh, theory stuff together that we've been talking about for the last couple of sections into one big topic that usually is called curve sketching. And the idea is to, to bring together all of our understanding of first and second derivatives into being able to draw a very accurate version of a graph based on all of the different calculations and measurements that we can get with those first two derivatives. Okay, so let's start with just recapping and filling in some gaps from all of the, the stuff ever since the beginning that we've been talking about with shapes of graphs and, and uh, so on and so forth. Okay, so at the end of last lecture, one of the uh, consequences of the mean value theorem, if you remember, was that we proved that on any interval that your first derivative is greater than zero, that has to be an interval where your graph is increasing. And any interval uh, on the x-axis where your, uh, your first derivative is negative, that has to be an interval where your graph, your function, is decreasing. Okay, not just singular values we're talking about here. We're now talking about big chunks of a graph, right? Whole interval sections from the x-axis that represent a slice, one piece of the graph. Okay, uh, so for example, if I have a graph that looks like this, this is the shape of some uh, fourth power uh, polynomial, okay? Notice I've found three critical points all the horizontal, the derivative equal to zero kind. It doesn't have to be that way, by the way. Uh, these could also be critical values where the derivative is undefined, okay? These could easily be cusps, and they could also be vertical asymptotes, breaks in the graph, if you will. It doesn't really matter. Uh, a critical value, if you go back to the original definition that we gave for it, um, the, the whole idea of a critical value is anywhere it's possible that the direction of the graph could change from increasing to decreasing or vice versa. So that's exactly what we're using the critical values for here. Once I've found critical values, I can then uh, try to set up the different intervals where my graph is increasing and decreasing. So notice what I have here is, you can see in the red sections, the graph is decreasing up until uh, certain points of the, the critical values here. And those are the intervals right here from negative infinity to A and from B to C that we would have labeled the function to be decreasing and vice versa. You can see where uh, critical value A and B in case a blue section here of increase and then to the right of critical value C I've got another blue section here. And those are the intervals that we have labeled as uh, increasing from A to B and from C to infinity. So that's uh, the ideas that you should have been getting from your derivative. And it all comes from the slope, okay? So the, the slope of the tangent line basically gives us the direction that the graph is facing. The rate of change, the instantaneous rate of change interpretation gives us the idea that we're either gaining or losing. So if the derivative is positive, I'm adding you know, value. If the derivative is negative, I'm taking away value. So whether you look at it like a slope of a tangent line or a rate of change at that instant, right, being positive and negative has direct impact on the function and the graph the same way right? Either decreasing or increasing, depending on whether it's negative or positive. Okay, so a new topic is what does the second derivative offer us? And if you remember, we've talked briefly about the second derivative. Um, we talked briefly about it when we were uh, instituting what the second derivative means when you're dealing with velocity. The second derivative was acceleration. Um, so that, that's one way to interpret the graph as well. But in general, 
what the second derivative gives us is the, the degree to which the graph is curved, okay? So the, if, you, if you think of the first derivative as your rate of change, the second derivative would be the rate of change of the rate of change, or in other words, how it's bent, how it's being pulled uh, in certain ways, okay? So that, that's where we throw in the word concavity. The second derivative is going to give us a direction of concavity. And we're not to the point in calculus yet where you would want to start measuring what we actually define to be curvature. That's a little bit further down the line when we start dealing with vectors and things like that. Um, but we can use concavity sort of like an on and off uh, sort of thing kind of like increasing and decreasing. If something is concave up, then it's like a, a U shape, okay? But it doesn't have to be that dramatic. Something that's concave up could be just ever so slightly curved off of a line, right? Something that's completely straight like a line has no concavity. So if you, if you had a section uh, that was a, a straight line, the second derivative at all of those places would be zero there'd be no concavity on something straight. But if you were to just bend it just ever so slightly in one direction, okay, so just even if it's just a little bit bent like that, then it's concave up. And even if it's just bent even just a little bit downward, it's concave down, okay? <clears throat> the second derivative is one of the things that we use to measure that kind of bend. So if the second derivative is positive, then that means I'm pulling in a positive direction. So you actually get some, some bend that the, the crater is pointing in that direction, in the upward direction. And if the second derivative is negative, you get the opposite. You get something that feels like it's pulling downward, right? So I get this concave down sort of bend, okay? Now remember, these are also, just like the first derivative, these are on intervals. I'm not talking about at singular values. I'm talking about on an entire interval, you can show that the second derivative is positive, or, or an entire interval, the second derivative is negative. Then we have this kind of concavity. And notice, these two are the same shape. It's just two different ways of analyzing the graph, okay? The m and the p values, notice these are not critical values but they are critical values of the first derivative. Let's recap on that for a second. They're not critical values of the function itself, right? That's these. These are critical values of the function. Notice that's where the derivative would equal zero or be undefined. These are inflection points, and inflection points have the same meaning as critical, uh, well, I'm sorry, inflection values, uh, they have the same meaning as critical values, but for the second derivative, okay? These are gonna be locations where your second derivative is equal to zero, and you have a moment to try and switch uh, the direction of your concavity, all right? So inflection values have basically the same definition as critical values, but applied to the second derivative. But technically, inflection values are critical values of the first derivative. These are going to be places where your, your first derivative is uh, zeroing out, or not zeroing out, but uh, these are places where the, the critical values are where it zeroes out. It's going to be places where your, your first derivative is hitting a, a maximum or a minimum, okay? Inflection values are critical values of the first derivative because these are gonna be places where your first derivative is either hitting the highest or the lowest that it can get, okay? So when it's curving, you see your, your tangent line is doing this, and right when it hits this inflection point, it wants to turn the other way, okay? Now notice, at this point right here, the, the slope is still positive, and it doesn't turn negative until this way, right? But it's at this point right here that it switches from, uh, in this case, from accelerating to decelerating, okay? 
Um, so we, what we do is we, you know, we find the inflection values the same way we find critical values, but with the second derivative. And then that can give us regions of concavity. Okay, so just to bring a lot of this information together, I have the four main combinations of first and second derivatives that you need to keep present in your mind. Something that is bent like this, it's bent upwards and it's gaining y value. It's increasing and it's accelerating. Now, be careful with that word accelerating. I don't mean that the second derivative is necessarily uh, positive. What I mean is the bend is going in the same direction as the gain. So in other words, not only is it increasing, but the increasing is increasing. The increasing is getting faster. Okay? So that's what we mean by accelerating here. The bend is helping the increasing. Right? It's gaining y value and it's going to gain it even faster. That happens whenever both your first and second derivative are positive on some interval. Next, uh, if you could still have something that's increasing, but if it's concave down, then your increasing is slowing down. Notice it's starting to cap out. Okay, It's still increasing, it's still gaining, but it's starting to slow down. So it's increasing but decelerating. That happens when your first derivative is positive and your second derivative is negative on an interval. I can also have the other two combinations that you're probably already imagining. I can decrease with a concave up, right? First derivative is negative, second derivative is positive. That's decreasing but decelerating. I know, wait a minute, wait a minute. You said, you said second derivative was negative was decelerating. No, I didn't. I said second derivative negative was concave down. Decelerating is the idea that the concavity is working against the motion, okay? So again, this one is decreasing, but the bend is upwards. It's like something is pulling it to, to bend it in this upward direction. So yeah, it's decreasing, but something is slowing it down and it's, it's starting to cap out. You see, it's not gonna decrease as fast after it gets to this point. Now right here, when both your first and second derivative are negative on an interval, you're gonna decrease and it's going to accelerate the decreasing. Your second derivative being negative uh, here means concave down. But the fact that they're facing in the same direction, it's decreasing and it's bending downwards, is what causes the acceleration here. Okay? So it's, it's losing value and it's accelerating. It's going to lose it even faster. Okay? So these are just some combinations that we run into a lot. Um, these are the basic ideas of how we want to approach curve sketching with derivatives. What I want to do now is break it up into how do we find each of these intervals. And then we also need to talk about the first derivative test for maximum and minimums and the second derivative test for maximum and minimums. Stay tuned. Let's begin talking about the method of collecting all of this analysis and all this data that we can get to help us uh, sketch curves and understand the shapes of graphs using derivatives. Let's start with just the first derivative here. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to, of course, find our first derivative function. And from that function, we would want to find all of our critical values. Those are going to be the locations. Remember, we, we originally uh, define the idea of a critical value this way. Those are all of the places where the first derivative can change sign. In other words, where the graph can change direction. So if I find all of those critical values, then I find all of the possible locations that could split uh, intervals between increasing and decreasing. And it doesn't matter what kind of critical value it is. It can be the equal zero kind. It can be the undefined kind. All of them must be counted and put into our list uh, with our data. All right? So let's start by doing our derivative and finding our critical values. First derivative here, f prime, 
is equal to 3x squared minus 6x minus 9. All right, so I'm going to do my critical values. And remember, we have two different kinds. The kind where I set it equal to 0 or undefined. Of course, since this is polynomial, this kind is not going to take place, right? We don't have any cusps, we don't have any breaks, we don't have any undefined regions in the domain. So the, the critical values aren't going to take on that particular fashion for this graph. However, they will take place on this one. Um, this is, can be factored. Uh, I've got x squared minus 2x minus 3. So 0 equals uh, 3 times x minus 3 x plus 1. So what I'm getting here is that I've got critical values at x equals 3 and x equals negative 1. Okay, so I've located my critical values. Next, I want to start listing those on some sort of chart so that I can make my regions of increase and decrease. And usually the easiest way to organize that is to make a big old x-axis and split it up into the different sections, the different intervals that these critical values make. So then that's what I'm going to start doing right here. I'm going to put a x-axis basically and I'm going to label them, be sure you put them in order, like so. Okay, I'm going to just make some little dividers here to give myself some space to work. But I've got the intervals here, right? Don't forget, this is the interval from negative infinity to negative 1. This is the interval from negative 1 to 3. And this is the interval from 3 to infinity. And then what I'm going to do is just uh, employ an old school algebra technique of uh, plug and test all of your sections, right? Also, the, the shape of the graph can kind of help you. I noticed that my first derivative is a parabola, so you, and it's facing upwards because it's positive. So you can almost imagine it. The, the first derivative shape is doing this, right? It's going to be positive up here and then negative for a little while and then positive over here. So you can kind of imagine it. But let's, let's get a generic technique going on here. What I'm basically going to do is just pick any x number I want and uh, test each section the same way. So picking a number between negative infinity and negative 1, right? I'll test um, x equals negative 2, let's say. Now what do I mean by test it? Well, I'm going to plug it in to my derivative, f prime of negative 2. And here I'm not really so concerned with the numerical portion of it as I am the sign of it, the S-I-G-N of this answer here. Okay, but let's go ahead and calculate it. I've got 3 times 4 and then I've got plus 12 minus 9. Uh, let's see, so that's 12. Oh, hmm. plus 12 is 24, right? Uh, minus 9 is going to give me 15. The fact that this is positive, right? That's what I'm concerned with. I could have picked any number in this interval, any number at all, and it would have come out to be the same thing. If you would pick negative 100, that's still in this interval, right? Plug in negative 100, you're gonna have a huge positive number here, right? Another positive number right next to it, minus nine is nothing. You're gonna get a big old positive number. That's why the critical values are so, pun intended, critical, right? Finding those gives me the only place where I could change that uh, that that pattern. 
So every value in this interval would give me a derivative that is positive. So what that means is the entire interval from negative infinity to negative one is an increasing interval. Does that mean that the next one is decreasing? Not necessarily. It doesn't have to alternate. You can have an increasing right next to another increasing. You can have a decreasing right next to another decreasing. Okay, it doesn't have to have any particular order to it or pattern to it. That's why we make these organized charts. Next, uh, I'll test the value in between negative one and three. Uh, we know which one that's going to be, right? Test x equals zero, and that's an easy one. So f prime of zero, easy, right? Negative nine. It's negative, right? That's the key. Any value that I picked in this interval would give me the same thing, okay? That's the, that's the reason we have the sections. So the fact that I got this one negative, that means all of them would have given me a first derivative that was negative. This section is decreasing, all right? And then lastly, from three to infinity, uh, let's pick something like 10, right? It doesn't really matter what you pick as long as it's in there. From three to infinity, x equals 10 is in that interval. So if I plug in 10, I've got 300, Minus 60 is 240 minus 9, f prime of 10, right? What did we say? 300 minus 60 is 240 minus 9, so 231. And again, I don't care about the 231 so much as I do the fact that I am getting a positive first derivative, which means every value, every x that I could have plugged in in that interval would have given me the same kind of first derivative. So that means this entire interval would have to be increasing. All right. So this is this is the first derivative chart for this graph. It actually gives me a ton of information. Okay. First of all, it gives me the critical values at negative one and three. Those are important because those are potentially turning points. If you're graphing a function, the most difficult regions to graph are the places where it turns because you don't know exactly where to stop the peaks at. You don't know exactly how much to curve it. You don't know if it's slowing down or speeding up at certain places. This is a good first attempt, <laughs> pun intended, first derivative, first attempt, at getting a lot of that shape information knowing that it's increasing, then decreasing, and the exact number where it changes. Now, along those same lines, when we're graphing these things, we would want to know if we have a relative max or a relative min. And if you've already gone through the trouble of making this entire chart, then you can easily employ what we call the first derivative test for relative extrema. Okay, the first derivative test is that if you have an interval that changes from increasing to decreasing across a critical value, then think about it, increasing to decreasing. It's got to be a maximum, right? It changes from this way to this way. And a little caveat, don't forget, that we're talking about if the function value exists, because you can have this kind of change around, say, a vertical asymptote, okay? You could have something that's uh, hitting a vertical asymptote, or trying to hit the vertical asymptote, increasing, right? And then on the other side, decreasing, and it could be like a volcano function. But since the function value doesn't exist, there's no max or min there, it's a vertical asymptote. That's not what we're talking about here. If you're going to have a max or min, of course, the function value has to exist. It could be a cusp. That's been, that's, that's been known to happen, okay? But it needs to have a function value at the point. So it's either some sort of rounded hilltop or it's a, a pointy cusp, whatever. If it changes from increasing to decreasing, then that particular value of the function, not the derivative, right? The derivative gives you the direction. The function is the relative maximum. Vice versa, if it goes from decreasing to increasing, right, this way, uh, then you would have a relative minimum. If you've already gone through the trouble, which, you know, with a lot of these graphing things, we will, 
if you've already gone through the trouble of making your first derivative chart, then you're literally 10 seconds away from using the first derivative test to label the critical values as relative maxes or mins. Uh, and by the way, there can be neither also. You can have something that goes from increasing to increasing uh, or decreasing to decreasing. Typically those are saddle points. Um, <clears throat> it, it just means you need to pay more attention because they're not relative maxes or mins if it doesn't change. Okay, that's the little uh, understood underneath here that I didn't write about. If it's not one of these two patterns, it's not going to be a relative max or min. Okay, but let me reiterate. If you've already gone through the trouble of making this chart, then you may as well finish it out with the first derivative test of the critical points and you can label them. So look, increasing to decreasing, that means f of negative 1, the original function, not the derivative, f of negative 1, okay, must be a relative max. Next, decreasing to increasing means that f of 3 must be a relative min. Notice I'm not saying absolute or global here. We're not on a closed interval anymore. It's not like the extreme value theorem. We're, we're sort of winging the shape of an entire graph here. So I don't know exactly if these are gonna be the tippity top, okay? I don't know if this one's gonna be the very bottom being a relative min, although we can kind of insinuate, right? This is an x cube on the original function and it's positive. So I know the shape is going to be something like this, just because we're familiar with polynomials for the most part. Okay, so it's exactly what we would expect on these two. Now, since we're talking about uh, doing the tests for max and mins, even though I'm not talking about the second derivative here, I want to talk about the second derivative test. Okay, because the second derivative test has nothing to do with the second derivative chart. We have a first derivative chart, we have a second derivative chart that's going to work the same way, but the second derivative chart has nothing to do with relative maxes and mins. Well, it has something to do with it, you know, they're all related, but I mean, the, the point to where we're talking about finding extreme values of max and mins is the critical values from the first derivative. We just happen to also have a second derivative test that you can measure whether or not a critical value is a max or min, okay? So I'm gonna reiterate a third time. If you've already gone through the trouble of making the first derivative chart, the first derivative test is probably the one you want to use. However, there are gonna be other cases later on, especially when we're uh, in the section called optimization, where we're probably not going to be going through all of this trouble of making the chart because we're not graphing. We're just looking for uh, maxes and mins. The second derivative test is a good way to save you time instead of having to make the entire chart for the first derivative test. Okay, notice the only thing you have to do for the second derivative test is of course you need to find the critical values first and the function at those critical values needs to exist. We can't talk about vertical asymptotes or anything like that. Okay. But if you have that critical value, you take that x value and you plug it in to the second derivative and the answer that you get, now remember this is not an interval, we're talking about a single value here. If the single second derivative value is negative, less than zero, then that means at that point it must be concave down, right, this way. Therefore, the, the critical point being the tippity top of it must be the maximum and vice versa. If you take that critical value and plug it into your second derivative, single value now, and that one value is greater than zero, then that uh, function value would have to be a relative min because it's in a concave down region. I'm sorry, concave up region because this is greater than zero. Now, of course, there's, there's more exceptions to this second derivative test. If you happen to get, um, let's, let's put a little side note here. If the second derivative at C is equal to zero or undefined, 
This doesn't mean that it's not one of those, okay? It can still happen that you have different cases where it's relative maxes and mins, okay? Getting a zero or an undefined for one of these simply says uh, that there is no conclusion. In the second derivative test, because we're, we're doing it faster, there's not as much data involved, right? We don't have as much going on. We're just plugging some numbers into the second derivative function. That means if you get one of these, it's more like a, we don't know yet. If you get zero or undefined for those particular values, it's very likely that it's not a max or a min, but there are a few cases where you can have a second derivative equal to zero uh, on a point that's a relative minimum or a maximum, for example. It can happen. So if you get this case, don't just write it out as, oh, it's neither. If you get this case, just be like, oh, well, that means I gotta look for something else. And you may have to come back and make the first derivative chart and go through the first derivative test because this is gonna be way more conclusive because you're getting a lot of data, a lot of intervals surrounding it, okay? So you have the first derivative test and the second derivative test, and all that's for is classifying whether a critical value is a relative max or a min or neither one of those, okay? That's what these two are in application for. The first derivative test has everything to do with the first derivative chart. The second derivative test is just plugging it into the second derivative. Uh, while we're talking about that, let's test these two critical values here. Uh, first, let's find the second derivative, right? Uh, let's see, split it off right here. Second derivative, derivative of this, right? I've got 6x minus 6. So here's my second derivative, right? All I would do at this point, and mind you, this is if I haven't already done this, okay? The only reason I would do the second derivative test is if I haven't done the first derivative chart and I just want a quick way to test critical values, okay? So note, you would have still had to go through this. I would have to have found the critical values, three and negative one, and then I would be skipping straight over to, hmm, let me just quickly figure out if these are maxes or mins, okay? So then F double prime of three, right? That's my first critical value there. Uh, well, depending on which way you look at it. <clears throat> is gonna be 18 minus six, which is 12. Since this is positive, this tells me that f of 3, the original function at that location, must be a relative min, right? That's what the second derivative is telling me here. It's greater than 0 at that point. And then next, if I plug in the second derivative of the other critical value, negative 1, uh, I get negative six minus six is negative 12. This is telling me that F of negative one must be a relative max, right? Just at that singular location. And yeah, it, it is, um, it is part of the link that those two do have the same size in the second derivative because that's connected to the curvature, the bend of the graph. But again, we're not worried about all that. I'm really just looking at the, the positive and negativity of this uh, for this test. So don't get the second derivative test mixed up with the second derivative chart that we use to, to sketch, okay? The second derivative test, we probably won't use much in this section other than just to make sure that you know how to use it, okay? This, this test is gonna come up a lot more when we're doing application problems of, hey, tell me if this is a max or a min real quick. For the most part, when you're curve sketching and talking about the shapes of graphs, you're already going to be creating this chart, so you're probably going to rely on first derivative test for max and mins. All right, so that's the first derivative chart and all of the apps that go with it. Um, next, we'll talk about second derivative chart. Now let's do the same kind of analysis, but with the second derivative and see what the consequences and the, the data tells us about the function 
uh, with the second derivative chart. So the same kind of uh, operating procedure here. If I'm going to make the chart, I need to know the sections to split. So then what I need to find in this case are not the critical values, but the inflection values. Okay, so my inflection values, let's go ahead and define that real quick. Inflection values are going to be locations where my second derivative is either equal to zero or in rare cases it can also be where it's undefined. Little disclaimer here, there are some books in some places I've seen where they don't define the inflection value to be where the second derivative is undefined. The reason why I'm putting it here is because in my opinion an inflection value has the concept of anywhere that the concavity has a possibility of changing. Okay, And there are several places where the second derivative is undefined because the first derivative is undefined and vice versa, you know, it can carry on from there where the concavity changes. For example, if you have a vertical asymptote with a volcano function, the concavity stays the same here. They're both concave up. But what if I have something where it does this? Notice there the concavity changes, concave up to concave down. So it's possible that since the second derivative is undefined at, at a vertical asymptote, that all your derivatives are undefined at vertical asymptotes, okay? You could have something that doesn't change concavity. You could have something that does change concavity, okay? So these kind of things uh, can happen, and therefore I'm including this idea in my definition of inflection values. So next, what I have here is my second derivative. We already found that a second ago, so I just repeated it here. And I'm just going to look for inflections. Right? We've got the two different categories, either 0 equals or undefined is equal to. Again, this is polynomial, so we're not going to have any of those undefined locations. Uh, but I do have a 0 equals location, right? If I add 6 and divide by 6, uh, directly from this I'm getting x equals 1, positive 1, is an inflection value of this graph. That should sort of make sense. Remember, we're, we're talking about an x to the third, and we already located two critical values. There's an inflection value right in the middle of the graph, okay? The, the actual symmetry of this graph has its center right there at that inflection value. But notice it's concave down on one side and then concave up on the other, okay? If you didn't know that beforehand, we're about to figure it out now anyway uh, using the chart. So I've got the same idea. I'm gonna make an x-axis and I'm gonna put my inflection value right in the middle there, positive one, and I'm gonna put a little divider and I've got my inflection value right there in the middle. And now I've got my two intervals here. I've got the interval from negative infinity to 1 and from 1 to infinity on my axis there. And just like before, all I'm going to do is plug in some test values for each piece. So on this side, from negative infinity to 1, I'll plug in, um, well, <laughs> I've already kind of tested this before. We did these calculations last before, right? Uh, we did negative one and we did uh, three. So kind of a spoiler here, but let's say you just randomly pick those numbers, right? F double prime of negative one is negative 12. And then if I plug in three, it's positive 12, right? So let's just say we randomly pick those numbers and, and we're already just plugging them in what would this exactly tell us uh, about our intervals here? It would tell me that since my second derivative is negative here, that this whole interval from negative infinity to 1 would need to be concave down. And the second derivative here, being positive, would tell me that this entire interval would need to be 
concave up. Right? So again, we're, we're making a chart of all the second derivative values, basically. Um, I've listed out every bit of the domain, and there's only three different pieces. I've got an entire section of concave down. I've got a singular value where the second derivative is zero, right? So technically for a moment, no concavity. And then an entire interval of uh, concave up points. So I've got a first derivative chart. I've got a second derivative chart. Notice I'm not having to classify the inflection value as anything because it's not a max or a min on the original graph or anything like that. It's just helpful to know where the inflection value is located, okay? If I actually plug the one back into the original function, I can actually get an inflection point. Just like the same thing with the critical values, I can get critical points if I plug them into the original function, okay? So anytime we, we're gonna be doing curve sketching, I'll start with that first derivative chart like last scene, then you would go to a second derivative chart like this scene, and finally, in the next scene, you'll see what we're going to do is put all of it together and try to draw a very accurate graph uh, of the function. Now it's time to take all of that information and bring it all together to try and sketch a good version of this curve. Okay, so here we have our function and I've brought together all of the information that we've collected and we're going to fill it out so that it actually makes more sense to us as far as the shape is concerned. Okay, so let's start with getting some quick function values here and I'll be able to graph them on the chart over there. So then right here I've got a relative maximum uh, apparently at f of negative 1. So I'm just going to plug negative 1 in here, right? So let's see, that's going to give me negative 1 minus 3 and 17, right? 9 plus 8, and then I've got um, minus 3 minus 1. So negative 4 and 17 is 13. If I plug in 3, that's 27 minus 27, 0, minus 27 plus 8, is negative 19, right? Okay, uh, and then f of one was our inflection. If I plug in one, then right here, I've got one plus eight is nine minus nine. So I'm ending up with negative three as a total there. Okay, so I found actual locations on my graph of these important features of the graph. Negative 1, 13. Okay, so on my graph here, I counted the y-axis by threes because I was kind of expecting large values here. So negative 1 on the x is here, but 13 on the y, uh, let's see, this is 12 right here. So negative 1, comma, 13 is going to be right here. And then my relative minimum is at 3, negative 19. So 3, this is going to be negative 18 right here on this mark. So 3, negative 19 would just be a little bit lower right there. And then my inflection value is at 1, negative 3, which is right here. Okay. So let's label those real quick. I've got 3, negative 19. I've got uh, negative 1, 13. And I, I'll, I'll leave the middle one labeled there. Uh, I mean unlabeled there. Okay, let's do the analysis of the shape now. I have the two different charts basically just squished up. Here's my first derivative chart, just with the basic information of where it's increasing and decreasing. And here's my second derivative chart right here, also squished up. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine these dividers here. Okay, so I've actually got four different sections of the graph where the, the combinations of the first and second derivative change. Think back to that first scene where we had all the different combinations, right? If it's increasing and concave down at the same time, then I'm going to have this kind of shape. It's increasing but concave down. Then it's decreasing and concave down for this little region right here, right? Because see, it's in the decreasing section, but it's still in the concave down section right here. So I expect this kind of shape. Then it's still in the decreasing region, but it switches to concave up. So that means it's going to do this kind of shape. Okay? And then it's in the concave up section still, but it switches to increasing. So increasing in concave up is like this. This is just to give you a generic idea of what kind of shape you should be drawing when you're approaching this. But that's kind of what we were expecting, right? We were expecting it to go up like this and then down like this and then back up again. So those shapes are starting to make sense. And I have to build it around these important locations. So I'm gonna make it real spiky here. And of course, the only other thing I could do is find all of my different um, intercepts, right? I can see that real quick, my Y intercept is at eight. So I know that's going to be uh, right here, basically. And it's going to go through that point right there. Um, so I know it's got to peak out right here. And then it's going to come and be still concave down until it hits this point, and then it's gonna start being concave up. So I'm gonna start curving it this way a little bit, right? Until I hit this point, and then I'm gonna curve it this way. The only other thing I could do from here is try to locate the x-intercepts. Uh, we didn't go through that, but I know it's gonna be somewhere over here, so. Not at negative two, though. <laughs> going to draw it outwards like this. Okay? So I'm getting a shape somewhat like that. Again, more accuracy just means I would find more information. I could have solved for the x-intercepts. I also could have plugged in more values. Since I found these important features, I could have plugged in some of the x values all around that to try and make it even more accurate. Okay? But in, in the analysis, what's important in the curve sketching is locating these crucial points that actually make a difference in the shape. And then everything beyond that is just how much fine-tuned accuracy do you want in your graph? Because you found all of the difficult points, maxes, mins, inflections, uh, so on and so forth, basic shapes in each piece, right? Basic directional shapes. But that's how we curve sketch. We get all of our first derivative and second derivative information put together into our different uh, combinations of curves. I locate all of my important points from first and second derivative. I try to, um, well, no, I don't try to. I actually label the critical values as max, as mins, or, or neither if I can. Um, and there I go again. No, no, you do, not just if you can. Um, and then you put all of that information together into some sort of shape. And you may have to draw it a couple of times sometimes. Maybe you're getting a first sketch down and then you're like, eh, it looks kind of rough, and then redraw it again and just how fine-tuned you want to get it. Quick peek at the actual graph here. I know the whole point is to, you know, graph it ourselves, but just so that you can see all of the points are lined up and, and the shape of the graph is uh, just what we thought it was, right? Here's our function right here, f of x, uh, x cubed minus 3x squared minus 9x plus 8. And as you can see, I've labeled the relative max and mins, and I've even labeled the inflection point there. And you can see the, the difference here in these things. Uh, you can see exactly where the, the concavity changes here at the inflection point and you can see that this is actually a relative max and a relative min. 
and it helps us graph uh, these things whenever we find these points. Let's do all of that again with another function, but let's do it all at once now so that you can see how I would approach a curve sketching problem, okay? So it's a lot of the different pieces of this section all put together. Uh, so I hope that you're picking up all of the little details as we go along, okay? I'll try to point them out as we get them. So I have my function and I wanna do a, a, a huge analysis on all of the different facets and I want to try and sketch the curve uh, as accurately as possible uh, within reason, right? So the first thing I'm going to do is find my derivatives and do my first and second derivative charts, right? So let's do that. Let's find our derivatives. Um, G prime of x is going to be equal to, and uh, this is a product rule, so I'm going to leave the x squared minus 1 alone. Derivative of e to the negative x is negative 1 e to the negative x. Plus, from here, I'll want to uh, leave the e to the negative x alone. And then do the derivative of this, which is going to be 2x. Uh, with a little bit of factoring, I can see that I'll have an e to the negative x in common, and I'll have negative x squared plus 2x uh, plus 1, like so. Alrighty, there's my first derivative. Let's do the second derivative. Second derivative is equal to, uh, again, it's a product rule where I'll count all of this as one function, and I'll have the derivative of the e to the negative x is negative 1 e to the negative x, and then leave everything else alone, plus leave the e to the negative x alone times the derivative here which is going to be negative 2x plus 2. All right. So again, I'm going to factor out the e to the negative x that they have in common. e to the negative x. And notice that this is leaving me with positive x squared. And then I've got negative 2x minus 2x, so negative 4x. And then I've got negative 1 plus 2, so plus 1, like so. All right, so I've got my first and second derivatives now. Let's rewrite those up at the top to save me some space here. So g prime of x is equal to uh, e to the negative x times negative x squared plus 2x plus 1. And the second derivative is e to the negative x times x squared minus 4x plus 1. All right. So now let's make some space that we've done these calculations. And let's make our charts. Before I could do that, remember what I need to do is find my critical and inflection points. So, uh, crit values. Remember, that's going to happen in two different places, either at an undefined but that's not going to happen because this piece is polynomial and this piece is exponential and both of those have domains that go from negative infinity to infinity. Yes, I know the exponential has a negative power. Technically, that's e to the x in the denominator. But still, e to the x is never equal to zero. It actually has the asymptote uh, at zero by itself. So this is not going to happen here. This is I'm not going to have any undefined locations here. 
Uh, we are, however, going to have some of these. The zero equals the first derivative. Uh, I'm going to split this because this is a multiplication equal to zero. e to the negative x equals zero never happens. We already just said this, right? Exponentials don't equal zero by themselves. Uh, but if you want to go through the trouble of solving it, right, take the ln of both sides and the ln of zero is undefined. So we don't do that one. However, from this one, negative x squared plus 2x plus 1 equals zero is something that we can solve. Uh, I'm going to use the quadratic formula. x equals negative 2 plus or minus square root. 2 squared minus 4, a is negative 1, c is 1, over 2 times a. So let's see, that's going to give me x is equal to negative 2 plus or minus the square root of, I've got 4 plus 4, so square root of 8 all over negative 2. That's the same thing as negative 2 plus or minus 2 square root of 2 over negative 2. The square root of 8 is 2 square root of 2. And then I can reduce right here by the negative 2. Negative 2 over negative 2 is 1. And 2 over negative 2 would technically be negative 1. But notice I've got both the plus and the minus. So it's got both anyway. So it would still be plus and minus, but it'll be one now, because two over two is one, times the square root of two. All right, so I've got my two critical values here, one plus the square root of two, and one minus the square root of two. Let's go ahead and separate those out. One minus the square root of two. One plus the square root of two is approximately two point four one four ish and one minus the square root of two is going to be negative zero point four one four ish um just one of those square roots that you you know hit a lot the square root of two is one point four one four so if you add one it's two point four if you do one minus one point four right it's negative point four <clears throat> okay so let's do our first derivative chart All right, so I'm going to put one plus, oh no, the first one should be one minus square root of two. The next one should be one plus the square root of two. And I'm going to split this up. Righty. So let's get out the handy dandy calculator. Um, this one is negative 0.4, right? So a good uh, first derivative point to test here would be uh, f prime of negative one. That's what I'm gonna test. F prime of, I'm uh, sorry, not f prime, woo! Need to have my Wheaties this morning. G prime of negative one, right? G prime of negative one is I'm just gonna plug negative one up into this guy up here that's going to be equal to e to the 1, just e, right, times uh, negative 1 squared is 1, negative 1, uh, minus 2, plus 1. So I'm getting e times negative 2, right? So in other words, negative 2e. I don't care about the 2e so much. I do care that I'm getting a negative, right? So the interval to the left, of 1 minus the square root of 2 is going to be decreasing. Incidentally, I know that the domain is going to be from negative infinity up to here because you really should inspect that beforehand. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't mention it, but before you start on a curve sketching, one of the things you always want to start on is the domain. Um, I, I noticed and failed to mention 
everything here is defined everywhere, right? Exponentials have that domain, polynomials have that domain. So I know that this integral is from negative infinity up to the negative 0.4. All right, next, in between the two, the easy point to test would be g prime of zero, right? That's in between the negative and positive values there. g prime of zero is going to be one times one, right? So I'm getting a positive one. Again, it's important that that is increasing, right? That's all I need to know. Then I'll do something like G prime of, let's see, something bigger than 2.4. So let's just do G prime of three. Why not? Okay, so I'm gonna get e to the negative three times, that's gonna be negative nine plus six plus one. Negative nine plus seven is negative two. So I'm getting negative two over e cubed, right? Because the negative exponent just puts it in the bottom. And again, I don't care about the two and the e cubed. I care about the negative uh, that I'm getting for the overall value there. And that's telling me uh, that this is a decreasing interval on out to infinity, right? I've only got two critical values, which means I've got three main sections, right? Okay. So I've got my first derivative chart. Let's do the second derivative chart. Uh, let's see. So I've got to find inflection values. Again, those can happen where the second derivative is undefined. For the same reason as the first derivative, this is not gonna happen because we have exponential, we have polynomial. Both of those are defined everywhere. So we're not getting any of those. Next, I've got zero equals e to the negative x times x squared minus 4x plus 1, right? And so I'm not getting uh, anything from this first bit, just like before. The exponential can't equal 0, but I can get some values from x squared minus 4x plus 1 is equal to 0, okay? Uh, another... Um, quadratic formula. So I'll have x equals uh, negative negative 4 plus or minus square root negative 4 squared 4 times 1 times 1 all over 2 times 1. Okay. So then I've got x is equal to 4 plus or minus square root of 16 minus 4, which is 12 over 2. I can reduce that 4 plus or minus 2 square root of 3 over 2. Okay, so I'm getting that inflection values. I've got two of them this time. I've got 1, not 1, 2, because 4 divided by 2, uh, plus... 2 over 2 is 1, square root of 3. And I've also got uh, 2 minus uh, square root of 3 there. Okay. Those aren't going to be as quick for me. So let me just punch them in. 3.732. And... 0 0.268, let's say, okay? All right, so from there, I'm gonna make my second derivative chart. Um, this one's labeled with the primes there. My second derivative chart, I'm gonna label 
2 minus square root of 3 and 2 plus square root of 3. Make my little dividers here. And now we're going to plug in some values. Okay, so G double prime. Let's do the middle one first, just because I want to. Of uh, zero, right? Wouldn't that be in between? Oh, no, it wouldn't. Ooh. G double prime of in between these two would be one. That's be a good one. Zero would be this guy over here. G double prime of zero. Uh, and then for this one, we'll do G double prime of four. Okay, so like I said, I was going to start in the middle just because, uh, just to change things up. G double prime of one. That's here. That's going to give me uh, e to the negative one times one minus four plus one. So that's two minus four is negative two, right? So I've got uh, concave down because this is going to be negative two over e. Okay, so I've got concave down. Next, g double prime of zero, that's going to be equal to one times one, which is positive one, right? So I've got concave up, and g double prime of four, that's going to be e to the negative four times, I've got 16 minus 16, right, zero times uh, plus one is one. Okay, so I'm getting that's just one over e to the fourth. Again, it's positive, so I'm interested in it being concave up. Nice. Okay, so let's list all of our important values and locations here. And then let's start graphing. Oh, we forgot. We didn't use the first derivative test to label our critical values, right? Here from the chart, if I'm going from decreasing to increasing, then I'm expecting this particular critical value, f of 1 minus square root of 2, to be a relative, max, uh, relative min. And if it's going from increasing to decreasing, then I'm expecting f of 1 plus square root of 2 to be a relative max. All righty. Okay, so let's actually plug in and get some values for these things. Well, let's go ahead and get them, you know, to a decimal point. And then we can try graphing this thing. Not F. Dang it. I did it again. G, right? G of those points. So I've got G of 1 minus square root of 2 that I'm feeling is important, and g of 1 plus square root of 2. Definitely those two are really important. Uh, I would also like uh, to have g of uh, 2 plus the square root of 3, and g of 2 minus the square root of 3, and also any intercepts, right? If I set this, uh, if I do g of 0, right, that would be the y-intercept. And also, if I set this equal to 0, I can find the x-intercepts, right? Notice the x-intercepts are pretty straightforward because the exponential part can't equal 0, right? So all I'm getting is x equals plus or minus 1 from that uh, x squared minus 1 uh, portion. Okay, so I've got g of 
1 is 0. G of negative 1 is also 0. G of 0 is going to be e to the 0, which is 1, times negative 1, which is negative 1. So these are important intercepts, right? Those would be good to know. Help me locate things on the, on the grid itself. Okay, let's do, let's do these values. One minus the square root of two. Okay, I've got the negative 4.14 in the calculator. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna use the, the ANS key for previous answer and plug it into the function here. Okay, so I've got uh, now the, the answer squared minus one in parentheses times e to the power of negative previous answer. Whoops. put minus or negative? There we go. I got negative 1.25. Okay. Now next, what I can do is change it to 1 plus the square root of 2. And then I'll just hit up a couple of times until I hit the, the place where I used previous answer in the function again and just hit enter again. So this one's going to give me 0 0.43. Okay. I'll have just enough room to do a, a small graph over there, right? Okay, 2 plus the square root of 3. Plug it into the function, and I'm getting uh, 0 0.31. These are kind of small numbers, huh? I'm going to have to do a larger scale here. Okay. And then lastly, 2 minus the square root of 3, plug it into the function. I'm getting negative 0.71. Okay. So what those are going to give me are the, the y values from the original function of where the different decreasing and increasings are, are going to happen, and also where the different concavities are going to switch, right? Don't forget, we've got different regions here uh, of where these things are happening. The, the 1 minus the square root of 2 is negative 0 0.4, whereas the 2 minus square root of 3 is 0.2. So this point is a little bit further over from this one, and we're going to have a region where it switches from decreasing to increasing but it's still inside of the concave up region, okay? So we're, we're gonna have a little bit of uh, the, the overlap there, right? Uh, if it helps, you can draw it out like this, you know, put your own little axis on there. The, the one minus square root of two is gonna happen first if you're reading from left to right. Then the two minus square root of three is gonna happen. Then a good bit further over, the 2 plus square root of 3 is 3.7. The 1 plus square root of 2 is 2.4. So it'll be 1 plus square root of 2 first. Uh, then it'll be the 2 plus square root of 3. Okay? So these two are the critical values. These two are the inflection values. Right? So I've got an entire region right here of decreasing. Right? Decreasing and uh, concave up then I'm going to be um, still decreasing. I'm sorry, uh, switch to increasing with concave up. Then it's going to switch to concave down, okay, but still be increasing up until I reach this point. Then it switches to decreasing, right, and it's still uh, concave down. And then when I hit the other inflection value, it'll still be decreasing because it's just an inflection value, but it's going to switch to concave up. Okay, so I'm going to have a, a piece that's decreasing and concave up, 
Then I'm going to have increasing and concave up, so it's going to go up a little bit like that. Then it's going to be increasing and concave down like this. Then decreasing and concave down. Then decreasing and concave up again. So we're going to have a function that's going to go do a little swirly and then taper out. All right. So let's let's throw a quick grid on here. Should be good enough, huh? All right. So let's graph the important points. So g of 1 minus square root of 2 at negative 1.25. So that's going to be 1 minus square root of 2 is negative 0.4. So negative 0.4 is about halfway here. Negative 1.25, so that's about right here. OK. And that one we've labeled as a relative min. OK, should kind of make sense. Next, uh, g of 1 plus square root of 2 at 0.4. So that's 2.4 and 0.4. So 2.4 and up 0.4-ish. It's going to be about right here. And that's going to be a maximum. OK? Then uh, I've got my inflection values at 2 plus square root of 3 is almost 4 and 0.3. So about right here. Uh, then this one was the 0.3, and it's down at negative 0.7. So it's about, uh, that makes more sense, doesn't it? About right here. And yeah, maybe a little further down. About right there, yeah. OK. So remember, we've already labeled uh, a couple of these as important locations, right? This is the, the min right here. This is the max right here. Okay. Now, not, maybe not the minimum and maximum of the whole function, but those are the relative min and the relative max uh, points there and there. We also found the intercepts, right? G of 0 is negative 1. See how that makes sense right here, right? G of 1 is 0. So again, see how it kind of makes sense. And a negative one also it hits right here. Okay. Um, before we get started, just if you have some prior knowledge of a graph, that can help as well. Don't forget, e to the negative x is something by itself that if you were to graph y equals e to the negative x, it's a graph that decreases like this, uh, approaching a horizontal asymptote. So what we're getting here is not very dissimilar than that, especially on the outer edges. We're going to get a graph that's coming from infinity on this side, just like this, because that e to the negative x is going to take over when it gets to be large x values. And then on the other side, same thing. The exponential is going to sort of take over, but it's going to want to taper off uh, to 0. So notice what we're going to get here is a graph that goes through this x value here, bottoms out right here, curves upward towards this point, then starts curving the other way because of the concavity change, and maxes out right here. It still wants to max out for a while, so it's going to do this, and then it's going to want to switch. Now, it's a very subtle switch here, but I want you to notice that this whole region here is concave down. And right here, it starts to bend ever so slightly upward right here, because what it's doing is it's approaching a, a horizontal asymptote uh, on that side. So it comes down, bottoms out, maxes for a little bit, and then, and then tapers to an asymptote there. Okay? So this is what curve sketching entails getting all of your first and second derivative information, okay, trying to get, you know, data as accurate as possible, getting intercepts if you can, those always help, uh, categorizing your um, critical values as maxes and mins. So keep that in mind uh, the next time uh, someone asks you to sketch a curve. You can actually go all out 
and get a nice decent uh, graph if you're willing to put in the, the extra data. Another quick peek at something that we just graphed so that you can see all of the important points and how it would look for real. Um, this is a quite interesting function, the x squared minus 1 quantity times e to the negative x. Uh, and as you can see, it's the exact shape that we were drawing before right here. Um, not only is it important that we find these max and min points, like right here point e is a relative maximum, point d is a relative minimum, and then you know the, the shape changing points where the inflection points f and g here. It's also important to remember that by finding these points, we uh, cancel out any thoughts of important points happening anywhere else. So if I, if I know I've exhausted a whole list of critical values, and I found the relative maxes and the relative mins and things like that, I know that they can't happen anywhere else. That, that's just as important as knowing where they are, is knowing that they're not anywhere else. So I can draw something like, oh, this piece right here goes up forever, uh, unbounded to infinity, and I know that this piece tapers off forever and never does anything else more interesting on this side over here. Okay, so it's not just finding these points, it's finding them uh, and not having them anywhere else that helps uh, drawing these things. Okay, uh, but notice we do have the, the intercepts as before. Uh, F right here is an inflection point and so is G. You can tell just barely the, the change in the curvature here. This is concave down. And then right here at G, you can see it starts bending the other way to be concave up here. Uh, same thing at F, right? It's definitely way concave up right here. And then it starts being concave down for this whole section here. To finish up talking about the stuff in this section, I just wanted to reiterate again on the second derivative test for classifying extreme values of functions. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to do the classification of some max and min or possible max and mins. We're going to do the classification of critical values of three different functions here uh, so that you can see that it doesn't actually have to involve any of the charts unless the, the second derivative test fails. Okay, so let's start with a of x here, x to the fourth minus 6x to the three. And I'm going to find two derivatives here. Uh, I'm going to do a prime, which is going to give me 4x to the third minus 18x squared. And I'm also going to find second derivative, which is 12x squared minus uh, 36x. Okay? So, to, to do this, first we need to find the critical values. Right? Crit values. And remember, there's two different kinds. I've got the undefined kind and the equals zero kind. Here it's polynomial, so don't expect the undefined kind. I'm just going to set the first derivative equal to zero. And I can do this one mostly by factoring. So I've got 0 is equal to 2x squared times uh, 2x minus 9. Right? So what I'm getting here is that I've got a critical value at x equals 0 and a critical value at x equals 9 over 2, or 4.5. Alright? To classify those two critical values, I'll use the second derivative test. A double prime of 9 over 2, right? I'm just looking for the concavity at that one location. A double prime of 9 over 2 is going to be 12 times... 81 fourths minus 36 times 9 over 2. So let's see, that's going to give me 3 times 81 minus 18 times 9. Um, 
3 times 81, right, that's 243, minus, that's going to be 81 times 2. Oh, huh. this is 3 times 81. This is 2 times 81. Guess what? I'm getting 81. Okay, and again, I don't care about the 81. I care that it's positive. So this is telling me that uh, A of nine halves is a relative min, okay? And you can see from the, from the little generic shape right here that that's exactly what's happening right here. This is gonna be that location at, at nine over two. It's a relative min, okay? Next, if I do A double prime of zero, that was my other critical value, Okay, so then when I plug in a double prime of zero, I'm getting 12 times zero minus 36 times zero, which is giving me zero. Now remember what happens with this, that means it's inconclusive. That doesn't mean that it's relative max, relative min, or neither yet. It means you need more information, okay? Now from the shape, you can tell it's a, it's a saddle point, right? It's a, it's a little swirly, cubic-looking thing. But how would we tell if we didn't already know the shape, which typically we don't when we're doing this, right? Well, unfortunately, at this point, you would have to go back to your first derivative and chart it just a little bit. Put that x value of 0 here, and then test some values on either side. a prime of negative 1, let's say, and a prime of positive 1. And you're basically just making a, a miniature version of the chart there. And I'm, I'm using the first derivative test at this point. The second derivative test was inconclusive. So then I got to step it up with more information and use the, the first derivative test here, right? So a prime of negative one is negative four minus 18. So negative 22, right? Which means it's decreasing here. Right, that's important. It's decreasing there. And then a prime of one is four minus 18, which is negative 14. Again, decreasing. So what the first derivative test is telling me that it's going from decreasing to decreasing, um, and this is a critical point, that means it has to be like a saddle type of, uh, of piece. Since this does exist and it's equal to zero type, it's not the undefined type, okay? Um, if it was the undefined type, that would mean something different. But since this is the, the equals zero type of critical value, decreasing to decreasing gives me a saddle. And, and that's exactly what you're seeing here, right? Like that. Next one. Let's take a couple of derivatives here. B prime is one third x to the negative two thirds. And B double prime is equal to negative two ninths x to the negative five thirds. Alrighty. So let's find the crit values. This one is not gonna have the zero equals kind. Undefined equals, and I'm gonna rewrite this as one over three x to the two thirds. Notice that this will never equal zero because the numerator is never zero, but I do get an undefined when the denominator is zero. This is telling me that B prime of zero is undefined. That's what this is telling me. So I have a critical value at X equals zero of the undefined kind, right? Okay. Now what about my second derivative? If I try the second derivative test, b double prime of zero is giving me negative two over nine times zero to the five thirds power, right? This is gonna be undefined also. So it's like I was telling you before, since you get something that's undefined or zero in your second derivative test, it means it's inconclusive. It could still be a max, a min, or whatever. You don't know. The second derivative test doesn't have enough information. So just like over here, when it becomes inconclusive for the second derivative, 
you got to go back to the first derivative and do your little chart. So on my first derivative, I'm going to put my x value, my critical value is 0, and I'm going to do a couple of test values, b prime of negative 1, b prime of positive 1, right? When I plug in negative 1, uh, or positive 1, by the way, the squared uh, gets rid of any negatives anyway, and it's in the denominator. All I'm going to get is 1 third for each of these. And what that's telling me is that it's increasing on both sides of this. So then you're thinking, oh, it's like the last one, since it goes uh, from one type to the same type, increasing the increasing, it must be a saddle, right? Be careful. This is not a saddle. And look, I even drew the shape for you. It looks like a sideways saddle, sure. But remember, this critical value is an undefined kind. So it's not even really what we would consider a saddle point, right? It's a vertical tangent. Since the, the derivative is the same on both sides, that means it's meeting up to make a vertical tangent, okay? The fact that these are the same is telling me that this is a vertical tangent because it's an undefined kind, okay? And then lastly, over here, something similar if we take our first and second derivatives, I'll have negative two-thirds x to the negative one-third, and then second derivative would be uh, two-ninths x to the negative four-thirds, right? Find my critical values, which is going to be where the first derivative is either zero or undefined. This one only has the undefined kind because you'd write it like this, right? The first derivative can be undefined, but the numerator of the first derivative is never zero. So I'm not getting any equal zero critical values here. I'm just getting the undefined kind, okay? And so in this case, uh, I'm going to be undefined when x is zero. So c prime of zero is undefined. That's my critical value. And when I attempt to test it with the second derivative test, c double prime of zero, notice that that would give me a division by zero, which is also undefined, which means it's inconclusive, right? It's inconclusive. So I go back to my first derivative test right here. I put my x value of 0 in the middle, and I test uh, c prime of negative 1 and c prime of positive 1. c prime of negative 1 is going to give me positive 2 thirds, because negative 1 to the 1 third power is negative 1. It's in the denominator. So I'm getting negative 2 over negative 3 which is 2 over 3. That means this section is increasing. C prime of 1, 1 to any powers itself, I'm getting negative 2 thirds this time, which means this is decreasing. Okay, so we're back to that first derivative test. If it goes from increasing to decreasing, it's telling me right here that C of 0 is a relative max. Okay, now again, don't forget, it's because the original C of zero does exist. There are the type of critical values where the function also doesn't exist, like vertical asymptotes. In that case, you just wouldn't even be looking at these points because you'd be like, oh, well, these are all undefined because the original point is undefined. But in this case, look, the, the domain on all of these functions that I'm showing you is negative infinity to infinity. The function themselves are defined everywhere. But these are different occurrences that can happen. You can actually have a max or min. You can have a saddle, which case the second derivative might error out on you. You can have a vertical tangent. The second derivative test will, will inconclusive on you. But you'll get something that's, that's agreeing on both sides. You can have something that is a cusp, but still a max or a min which means the, the critical point is undefined, but the function value is defined, and then the first derivative test will flesh it out and show you 
that you do indeed have a max or min. Okay? So I hope all of this has helped you understand how we can use first and second derivatives to uh, analyze the shape of graphs without actually having to graph them and eventually to, to help us graph them.